my name is Darla Lowe, and I'm one of the workers on Westminster's Audio Preservation and Digitization Project. Today I'm going to guide you through the process of recording and digitizing an audio tape. We house most of our audio tapes right along this wall, and also right over here. There are two main types of tapes that we digitize, those would be polyester and acetate. Our green labels stand for acetate tapes. They have a lighter brown color, and when you hold them up individually, um, there you can see through them. Kind of hard to see on the on the phone. Much easier in person. And then here have an example of a polyester tape. These are going to be darker in color and they're not see-through. So today, the first thing that we do is take a look at our media preservation workflow. This allows us to see where in the process we are and what next needs to be recorded. So today over here, we have acetate tape 0549. This is our tape deck on which we record the tapes. So we'll go ahead and take our acetate tape out. It already has leader applied to it. Acetate tapes usually contain leader already. Um, if we didn't have leader already on the tape, we would go over here to our workstation where we apply leader. Um, this is our leader, as well as tape to attach it to the audio tape. That's as we've already got that, we're good to go. We'll make sure that all our settings are correct. So for the smaller acetate tape, I need to adjust the real size. I'll go ahead and place it right here. And then secure the tape. And on the other side, I'll place an MP reel. And secure that as well. So we'll go ahead and feed the leader through here. and take it and feed it right into the empty reel, winding it once to get that leader secure. The reason that leader is important for the tape is that if we were to take the tape itself and wind it like this, we would be damaging part of it and also losing part of the tape from the recording process. So it's important to have that leader at the beginning. So we'll go ahead and press the record button once on our audio recorder. That will allow us to listen to the tape um, before we actually finish recording it so that we can just see what's on it. So we'll go ahead and press play. I'm just going to adjust these two dials. So this seems to be some sort of lesson or beginning of a program. We'll go ahead and stop it and then rewind it so we can get it right from the beginning. Okay. Play right there. And then we'll hit record once more which will start our recording. And once we've done that we're good to go. It'll record straight into this USB which will then transfer to the computer to do some editing. One of the first things we do in the morning once we've checked our preservation workflow is see which tape needs to be recorded. If it's an acetate tape, it goes right on the tape deck. But if it's a polyester tape, it needs to be baked in a convection oven for about six hours. Today we have this polyester tape in um, the convection oven. This is an important step because tapes tend to deteriorate over time. Acid tapes can never be baked, but polyester tapes need to be because they experience something called sticky shed. This happens when the 
tape starts to come off of the binding and can actually be seen on the tape deck itself as sort of like a powder. So this helps to stop that from happening and once it's been through for about six hours we see a lot less sticky shed. So once the tape has finished recording, we'll go ahead and take that USB and we'll plug it into the computer. We have a variety of different um, programs that help us to edit the tapes, but the one that we use most frequently is SoundForge. So I'll go ahead and open that program. Once we've done that, we'll go ahead and drag the audio file into SoundForge. Right now there are just short clips there, but we'll go ahead and what, what it generates, we'll then edit. So I'm going to go ahead and open one that's a work in progress. first thing that we need to do when we open a tape that hasn't been dealt with before is do a process called normalize. Normalize will allow us to bring the peak levels to a, a certain range, which then can raise the overall volume of the recording or reduce it, whichever needs to be done. So in this case, the peaks are pretty um, within the right range. We've done a little bit of editing, so it's almost good to go. But with something like this, it definitely needs to be raised in volume. So what we'll do is process, normalize, and bring it to um, a certain level that will raise it. So that's a little bit loud. What we can do is undo and just keep playing with that until we find the correct output level. Then the next step that we'll do is go ahead and take all this time before the recording starts and get rid of that empty space and insert some silence. There are lots of different process and effects that we have available to us on these programs. Uh, the ones that we use the most often are a de-hisser, a de-clicker, and de-crackler, things like that that just end up on the recordings um, either through the process of reco recording them on the tape deck or just because of the actual tape itself. Um, we also have tools such as noise reduction that are really important for getting rid of coughs in the background or air conditioning and things like that that just help improve the quality of the sound. Once the tape gets to a certain level, we'll go ahead and save it in our system. We save everything onto our hard drive here and onto Google Drive. That allows us to have multiple places that we can access the files. On our Google Drive, files are saved according to their file number and their barcode. And all of these will be available to um, students and faculty um, once they've been done in the entire process. They also, all of the information from the files get saved into our Excel drive. Uh, so this way we have a record of every single tape and a record of the program if that's available, as well as the duration of each and every piece um, on the tape. So here we have an example of um, an art song festival. We have the date available, the project folder, barcode, track titles, duration of pieces, uh, composer of the pieces included in the tape, and the performers, as well as a choir if that's applicable. Sorry. Uh, we also include notes, so just so we have a record for every student worker or worker involved in the process of things that went wrong with the tape, things that we think could be improved maybe with future applications, or anything we need to let other people know. Once these tapes are saved and finished in this process, 
we go ahead and make CDs of them so that we have uh, a copy on the hard drive, a copy on Google Drive, and a copy on CDs. Once we've finished editing a tape, we need to make two CDs, usually two per side, to have in our collection. So we use Windows Media Player to burn the CDs onto. We will set it to burn first, and then drag and drop the individual tracks into the Windows Media Player. These tracks are edited out of the entire um, side of each tape. Once that's done, we'll hit click burn. And insert a CD, which will automatically burn onto the CD. Once we're done with that, we'll go ahead and label them with the other computer. Once we've burned the CD, we'll go ahead and open our Excel spreadsheet, as well as the label for our printer. On the spreadsheet, we'll find the corresponding disk number, which in this case is 0759. We take the information given to us on the album title and insert all of the information we need into the label. If there are two discs, we'll discern between disc one and disc two, two discs meaning two sides. We'll input the title, the album title, as well as the relevant um, performers. And then the date of the concert. Then center this. And print. This is our CD printer. It works a little differently than our normal printer would. We need to lift this part in order to insert our CD. We'll put the CD on the CD tray and insert it so that the arrows connect. So we'll push it in just to those arrows. And then it will automatically print. For this CD, we got very lucky in that there was a program attached to it, so we were able to input a lot of information. But for some of the tapes, not a lot of information is given to us. Sometimes they're missing programs, or they're only notes scribbled on the back of the box. We do our best to input as much information as possible so that these labels can be very accurate. But in the case that they're not, what we would do is input as much information as we have and leave the rest of it blank instead of making updates or things like that. So what we would have on this CD, if we weren't given a date, we would write everything we know and leave out the date or leave out performers. Here we have an example of a tape that was completed and made into a CD and labeled. Once the labeling is done, we take our CD over to our CD collection, where we have the remainder of our CDs. 
All of these boxes house our CDs that have come from tapes that were recorded, edited, and then made into CDs and labeled. We'll locate the appropriate box and open it and place our CD in the correct place. polyester tape. Polyester tapes tend to have less signs of damage than the acetate tapes. They tend to hold together better over time. But here you can see an example of a bit of soft binder syndrome. You see on the outer edge of the tape, it holds together really well. And as we get towards the middle to the um, front of the tape, there's a bit of a gap. That means that the binder that holds um, the tape together is just starting to deteriorate a bit. It's not too big of an issue at this stage, but when we see worst cases of it, it becomes more of an issue. This is why baking the tapes is so important, because it can help to right some of those issues. So we'll go ahead and put that away. Acetate tapes tend to deteriorate much more quickly over time, and they're a top priority for us to record. These are two signs of vinegar syndrome, but also, as you can see, that soft binder syndrome as well. Vinegar syndrome is uh, something that happens only to acetate tapes, where they begin to smell like vinegar very strongly in some cases, but they also start to deteriorate the actual tape as well. So the vinegar smell is sort of a byproduct of the issues. You can see that this one specifically has started to almost form like a diamond shape because it's so warped. Uh, and this is that binding coming undone. of damage that's caused by vinegar syndrome, which is called warpage. When I undo the leader, you can see that the tape itself is quite brittle and has what we can perceive as like kinks in it that are the tape actually being warped. So you can see some of that. It has a consistency of almost like a ruler. It's very hard. Uh, and we see a lot of issues with tapes that display warpage when we go to record them. This is because the tape sometimes will actually um, bend as it's trying to be recorded, and then there's lots of issues during playback. Here we have another sign of damage, a very actually severe sign of damage, which is called delamination. This happens when the tape itself starts to come off from the plastic backing. So I'm going to be really gentle. You can see it's actually come almost completely off of the plastic and is continuing to as I hold it. So I'm going to go ahead and wind that back up. We're doing lots of efforts to try to fix things like this. Um, one process that we're trying is called rehydration. So here I have a tape that's ready for rehydration that is displaying signs of warpage and also soft binder syndrome starting to come off from the binder. So what we'll do is come over here to our fun rehydration contraption that we've set up. Um, this is a process that we developed um, from a prominent audio um, recorder, Richard Hess. I do have one here currently, another one of that's displaying signs of warpage. Um, it is seeing some success. We're still working through exactly um, how long they need to be in the rehydration chamber, essentially. But what I would do is I'd open this. At the bottom, there's about an inch of water. And inside the larger bin, there's a smaller bin, which we need to place um, the tape onto a spacer. This allows the water to act as um, a rehydrator without the tape actually ever touching the water. So then what we'll do, this container is open, we'll close the larger container, 
and that allows it to be completely secured into a 100% hydration area without ever touching water. We continue to record tapes with different types of damage, but the one type of tape that we don't record is those that have been impacted by mold. These are generally considered unsafe, especially for student workers, and we try to bag them and keep them in a contained area away from other tapes. So here we have lots of our tapes that um, do show signs of mold. They're kept here, bagged, so the mold doesn't spread to other tapes. Another set of quarantine tapes that we have are those that display um, vinegar syndrome. Vinegar syndrome can spread, so we try to keep the tapes that have the worst vinegar syndrome over here and away from other tapes. Thank you so much for your generous contributions. The Flummerfell Fund has made it possible for us to continue our work and our goal of preserving Westminster's legacy so that it can be shared with past, present, and future Westminster students and alumni.